Hey everybody, Josh Sheridan here with the Barely Legal Podcast. On today's show, I'm very excited about my guest. She is the author of From Lawyer to Law Firm. She runs a uh, small law firm consulting business. And by small law firm, I mean small law firm, not a small consulting business. Um, her name is Elizabeth Miller, but we affectionately refer to her as Liz. Liz, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So this uh, episode, I think, will help a lot of my colleagues more than maybe some of my other episodes. Uh, those have been just, you know, people of interest. But you've actually got something of value that a lot of the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis will probably want to hear and know about. Um, but before we even get to what it is that you do today, I kind of want to talk about how it is that you came to do that. So uh, are you from Florida originally? Actually, I'm not. We moved here in 1985, but when I tell people that, they say, oh, you're native. Yeah. So Where did you move from? We moved from New York. Oh, I think I can hear the New York in your <laughs> accent still. We're about to New York. Um, we lived in Queens, and oh, I worked wow. in Manhattan. Yeah. And you're legit New York. Yeah, yeah. But um, people just say that they can hear it when I get mad. Okay, That's well, luckily now. I I Maybe haven't heard you that can... yet. <laughs> you never will. <laughs> My goal is to avoid hearing your accent then. <laughs> so how old were you, not to, not to date you, but how old were you when you moved here from New York? I was 25. Okay, so you had your formal education up there. Yeah, well, no, I didn't. Actually, I went to school in my 40s. Okay. Um, My husband was in a bad car accident when he was 35. Okay. And so um, I was supposed to go to law school and never did. So I went, I went in uh, my 40s, I went to Eckerd and I got a uh, bachelor's in okay. business administration. And then I went on and got a master's degree. But I was in my 40s. Wow. Did, what did you work as before that? Um, I worked as a paralegal. Okay. I spent my whole career you and know. as a paralegal just in Florida or in other states as well? Well, in New York. Okay. Six, seven years in New York and then coming down here. Was it specific to any practice of law or was it kind of everything? Personal injury. Okay. That's my personal injury and medical malpractice. That's my baby. So you were uh, very involved in all the pre-lit on those cases and what that entails? Pre-lit and litigation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was... It was um... How was uh, New York different from Florida? Um, for one thing, it's very cold up there. I go back now <laughs> and I can't, I can't, can't stand it. it. No, for one sure. or two days and I'm out of there. I can't, I can't take it. Well, what I meant actually was how, how is practicing pre oh. in, in New York different from Florida? But <laughs> Sorry about no, that's that. that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, actually, you know, what was the most interesting thing. You never heard about attorney up there getting disbarred. Really? Never. And I, you know, seven, eight years, never, never, never. I came down here and they it was happening one after the what other. What do you attribute that to? I don't really Shadier know. Shadier attorneys in Florida <laughs> or a more strict bar? No, I, actually, I think it's a more strict bar. Yeah. I've never known an association that is so tough on their own members yeah. as a Florida bar. Well, I, I can probably speak speak uh, volumes about that but i uh you know i i definitely uh sometimes have kind of a love-hate relationship with the florida bar but i understand that they're there for a reason and they've got a job to do but it, it, it you know it is not uncommon for me to wonder <laughs> if they're if they're here to help or, or here to be yeah exactly uh, you know uh, an obstacle so um, now, at some point, uh, did you run like a paralegal service? I did. And when did and, that start? Well, it's actually funny. When I moved here in 1985, I went to work for an attorney who got disbarred. Okay. And I said, okay. So I went and got another job, and he got disbarred. And they were already both, you know. So it was 1988, and I thought, damn, you know, third time's a charm? No, I don't think so. And I opened up my own paralegal business. Doing work for attorneys sure. only. And I had that probably about 16 years or so. 
Um, and that's before, you know, you got paralegals outside, you know what I mean? And it was like, oh, my God, are you going to lose my paper? Because I had actual files. Sure. You know what I mean? So they were like, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to lose your paper clip. Don't worry. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Now, uh, with that service, did you have contract workers underneath you? No, it was actually. Oh, sorry. The other one. Oh, sorry okay. about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> Put that. No, I want. Okay. So, um, how many people did you have under you? Well, actually, what happened was that I had one person working for me, and um, she tried to walk away with the piece of my business. Oh gosh. And then I hired another one who did the same thing. Okay. And after that, I said, you know what? Screw it. It's my name anyway. So whatever it is, it is. And whatever I can't do. You know, I'll just do as much as I can, but I wasn't going to have somebody walk away with the piece. Now, your services, were they still uh, specific to uh, civil plaintiff's work, or did you kind of expand into family law and some other things like that? No, I pretty much stayed plaintiff's personal injury and medical malpractice. Throughout the entirety of your career as a Yeah, paralegal. pretty much, yeah. So, uh, how, how did the uh, seed of becoming a consultant uh, come into play? Um, in 2004, one of my attorneys had his office manager leave. Okay. And he said, hey, you want to be my office manager? You know, blah, 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 whatever. And I thought, well, this, this is my opportunity to segue my career into something else. And so that's what I did. I just closed down the paralegal business. I went to work for him. Okay. And uh, now I know at some point you crossed paths with Jordan Jenkins, who's kind of family law royalty around here. She's yes. been around forever. I drive by her office on Kennedy all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, even before I knew you or knew of you, was aware that she was uh, the Stephen King of uh, legal uh, handbooks. Yep. By that, I mean she's very prolific. She's yes. got, you know, numerous ebooks on any number of different topics. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the way I came to you, interestingly enough, was through a former associate of mine right. who had been using your services. And uh, his name is Christian Pipus. When he worked for me, he used to love to critique what I uh, spent money on as a <laughs> business owner and what I didn't. So I figured if he, if you kind of cleared his vetting, that you it must be worthwhile. And obviously, uh, you know, I've been very pleased so far with with our time together. But how is it that you met Jorn and started writing the book and and that sort of thing? Actually, I met Jorn through the second attorney that I worked for here when I came to Florida. Okay. Who got disbarred? She was married to him. Okay. And so um, she divorced him, and I separated myself from him. And uh, but we stayed friends for like thirty years. We stayed friends, you know. So. Yeah. Now, is this the only book that you've written? Or this you... is the only one that I've written. I think about writing a um, a second edition. Sure. But you know, I'm not I'm not too sure on that yet. And I have another book that I'm working on, but um, we'll see what happens. So uh, the again, the, the book is called From Lawyer to Law Firm: How to Manage a, a Successful Law Business. And and how did you set that up? Did you was this an idea that uh, began with you or with Jorn or the two of you together? How did that come to pass? Actually, it's funny. It was Jorn's idea. Okay. One day, Jorn said to me, um, I think you ought to write a book. And I said, about what? And she said, about law office administration. And I said, I don't have enough to fill a book. Are you kidding me? You know? So she said, well, why don't you? Know, why don't you? So I did. And six weeks later... I'd written more than half of the book, um, taking all the articles because I write for Law Office Manager Magazine and okay. I do their webinars and stuff. So I took the articles that I had written and lengthened them into chapters. And six weeks later, like we had a book and we were on our way. Um, so how is the book broken up? Is it kind of kind of in, in writing what your process is when you come into a business and what you're looking at? I mean, is there specific sub subsections, areas that you're kind of looking at to kind of assess the health of a, of a small law practice? Well, I would say it's probably a little bit of a combination of both. Okay. If you wanted to um, at least get an idea of how to run a firm and what you should do and what you shouldn't do and that kind of thing is definitely in there. Um, you know, there's chapters about like trust accounting and 
my favorite subject billing mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so even if you're not going to hire somebody like me, it'll give you an idea of like what's important and what's not important. Um, you know, we talk about hiring people and, you know, are they a good fit and how do you do social media and stuff like that. Well, so I, I kind of, in my mind and my perception of you, kind of the analogy would almost be similar to what I do when someone comes to me and they're thinking about a divorce or something or like maybe a general care physician, but you're having to take a, a, a blank slate and kind of analyze and figure out what the issues are and then right. how best you can address them. So uh, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't really figured out yet how to track the listenership to this show, but I would imagine that some of my colleagues who, you know, run practices listen to this. So uh, I kind of wanted to perk their ears up a little bit. I don't want you to give away, you know, uh, uh, what do they call it? Not work product, but... Uh, secrets, secrets. Trade secrets. Trade secrets, <laughs> sure. But at least to pique their interest... When you're coming into a business, uh, do you kind of have a process for, for how you figure out what they're doing right, what they're not doing right, and how they can improve? Um, yeah, I kind of have a process. Um, I talk to all the employees there. I talk to the business owner. Um, you know, there are some things that are just red flags. Like I know that if um, they haven't done a billing in like six months, that billing is obviously an issue. Would you say um, that billing correctly is one of the biggest uh, biggest the, plagues faced by small practice attorneys? It is, without a doubt, the biggest. Because you know what? Without money, you can't do anything. It's, I mean, it's, it's air in your lungs. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, put, you know, employees aside and benefits aside and all that. Without money, you can't do anything. You can't. You, you you, know? Not only can you, you know, it's... It, that's a, that's a very simple thing to say, and it's something that intellectually I think most people kind of understand or at least think that they understand. But if you really kind of dive down and focus on that, uh, you know, a lot of attorneys that I know love to do charitable things, love mm -hmm. to do things with their spare time, whether it's the arts or helping with charities or whatever else. But if, if you can't pay your bills, you don't have any time to do charity. You don't have any time to do you know, uh, you know, donate your time. So, you know, there's, there's kind of this dirty word mentality with money or making money where, you know, I don't want this to be about the money. Well, that's fine, but it, it kind of has to be at some level, right? Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to pay your people, you have to pay your rent, you got to keep the doors open, you know, that kind of thing. You know, so often an attorney will say to me, well, I just don't have time to get to the billing. I have time, you know, and I'm like, you She's don't. She's basically saying verbatim what I've told her a million no. times, by the way. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, how do you not have time to do the billing? I don't understand. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? Like, it just has to get done. And if you're not going to do it, then by all means, have me do it yeah. or have somebody do it. And there's a very specific, you know, you got to close billing at the end of the month, period. There's no extensions. There's no nothing. You got to close it. You got to do your pre-bills. Bills have to be out by the fifth of the month. Why do you think people pay their mortgage on time? Why do you think that they pay their car payment on time? Because they know it's coming. Well, if they know a bill is coming from you, they're going to be prepared to pay you. And I don't mean you. I just mean That's okay. generally. I'm pretty, pretty you know? open with people about my uh, flaws. <laughs> Um, you know, it just, it doesn't make any sense, you know, do the charity, do everything. That's all great, but have your house in order. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, there was a, you've seen on Facebook, I kind of post those takeoffs of that guy holding the sign and there was uh, one that said, you can't pour from an empty cup. Right. And, you know, I was kind of thinking about that because, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but a lot of my friends and colleagues, you know, we are sympathetic to people who are in bad situations that maybe, you know, don't have the money right then or don't have the money at all or there's an emergency or whatever. And the problem is, is there's an endless supply of that. So when you have people saying to you, I don't have the time for billing, I think what they're kind of saying is, is that they are only looking at one side of the equation, which is wanting to help, 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 but 
if you lose your business, you can't help them at all. So exactly. again, again, it's kind of a, you know, you gotta, you gotta butter both sides of the bread as it were in, in that regard. Well, aside from billing, what are some other uh, major epidemics that you see with uh, practices? Well, the billing is the big one. Um, trust account reconciliation, which kind of goes with the billing because you manage the trust account as you're doing the billing. But um, you would be you would be amazed at the messes that are out there. Oh, People I mean, haven't... trust accounts are the, 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 the boogeyman for oh. most attorneys I know. I mean, you know, it's... You know, I, I would guess that a lot of people that have had issues with the bar as it relates to the trust account, they're not unethical people. They're not people setting out to, uh, you know, grift people, but you just got to get that thing squared away and you got to have it reconciled, you know, between what your trust account said, what your files say, what your income, you know, the, the three-way reconciliation right. is so important to be able to you know, show anybody who needs to know that you're, you're on point as far as that account goes. So I, I, that one, that one I'm definitely, uh, aware of and religious about what else yeah. besides, uh, trust account and billing, um, hiring, just firing, hiring, staff, firing, staff firing issues. yeah, staffing issues, uh, management of the staff policy and procedure manual. That's, yeah, that's a, another one you helped us with. Big that's time. a Big Job one. descriptions for employees. Yeah, everything. I mean, every, a policy and procedure. It is a big one because when you have an issue with a with an employee, and you go back to the manual, and it's all there. You can't. There's no wishy washy whatever. And you would be amazed at the firms that don't have a policy and procedure manual. It's just I I just don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah, that's one of the big ones. Um, you know, ordering supplies, yeah, that's not so much anymore. Well, you know? for me, though, that actually that brings up a good point, is I'm, I'm always looking for some formula for costs versus revenue. Like, you know, are those, are those commensurate with each other? Am I just spending way too much money on staff, vendors, you know, search engines, uh, child support guidelines, calculators, client management software, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, you know, is there kind of a uh, ratio, and I'm not putting you on the spot here to say what it is, but, um, you know, am I spending too much for what I'm making and that sort of thing? I mean, mm -hmm. so that's, you said that's not quite so much, but for me, that's definitely something that I think about. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's a big deal for everybody. I mean, if you're spending more than you're making, then I think Well, obviously you're... that's a yeah. Yeah, that's like a yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, there's ways to track that stuff through mm -hmm. your bookkeeping. The the thing is that who's going to do it? Yeah. Somebody has, you know, and for solo, solo and small firms, they don't have office managers. There's no reason, you know, what am I going to do? Watch paint dry or something, you right. know, for the rest of the day. It's not a full-time job. Right. But, you know, like once a month, look at the statements, look at the income and expenses, look at what you're doing. You know, if at the end of the year you're going broke, you need to quit and go get a job or something. Cause it just, it's not working. Right. Well, uh, kind of, jumping around a little bit, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about billing because, you know, in our time together with you helping our firm, that's been our major focus. You know, you've kind of uh, explained to us that, you know, that is the number one with a bullet issue that we've got to get dialed in. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what are the types of things that you're looking at when you're looking at what the billing is that, a, that an office does, aside from just actually doing the billing? Right. Well, for one thing, I'm looking at, does the firm have a billing quota? Okay. You know, um, if you have a paralegal that you're paying $55,000 a year to and she's billing 20 hours a month, there's a problem. And and I had, uh, I've talked with you before, and I think you've corrected my thinking on this, but at some point in my, in my time as a business owner, I had uh, learned of the rule of threes or the, the, mm -hmm. the, the three multiplier, which is mm -hmm. effectively that a staff person should be generating revenue three times what they're being paid. And I think you kind of told me that that was somewhat of an outdated philosophy. Yeah. Well, they're usually, they go three to five times is what it should be okay. and if you do you know if you do that math you know that's pretty you know that's pretty significant 
you know, what somebody can generate for you. But if they're not even doing that or if you're breaking even or something, there's no point. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you hire somebody for 55000 and they're billing out 55000 you, you might as well not even have them. It's just you, cancel it. You cancel yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, at some point uh, in my life, I read a Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Have you ever read, read that book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the whole premise of that book was basically uh, passive, passive income, how to develop uh, passive income. Uh, and so this is something that I've kind of thought about a lot in, in my business. And, you know, the, the great thing with things like PI and, and MedMal and those types of cases is uh, there's a opportunity for windfall, meaning mm -hmm. you can you can have a case where you generate a demand letter and get a policy limit on that case. And so the time spent on a case is not commensurate with the potential revenue that it could generate. Right. And with family law, though, it's, it's a little bit different because there's not going to be a windfall. You're, you're going to be paid for the work that you do. And so there's a time for money aspect of it and we all know that we've got you know 24 hours in a day seven days in a week and the market will only allow for a certain hourly rate locally mm -hmm. you know it might be higher in new york or in miami right. or some of these big city areas but uh what i've found here is you can't probably unless you're board certified go to north of 400 dollars an hour as a family law attorney based on your experience that's not that's not a rule without exceptions but you know that's that's kind of where it caps out now if you have the board certification or in certain other circumstances you can go higher than that but you know just in my you know i'm going on 20 years here so i kind of know what people can spend and there's outliers again on either side but mm -hmm. That's kind of the amount. So if we say four hundred dollars an hour, mm -hmm. and realistically you can't bill twenty four hours in a day or seven no. days a week, so there is <laughs> to some extent a cap. Let's say right. if it's twenty hours a week or twenty five hours a week or whatever it is. So that times four hundred. That's the most that you can bill mm -hmm. as an attorney. But right. getting back to my Robert Kiyosaki, uh, rich dad, poor dad, is you can buy houses and generate rental income. So in this circumstance, what that would be would be billable staff. Mm -hmm. These are your houses that you're generating exactly. a rental income off. So a paralegal is a nice house, that, a vacation home that you can generate. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying literally speaking, but these are ways that you can exceed what you actually have the time to uh, do yourself. So right. if you can bring in the good cases, if you can bring in the paying clients, and then you can expand uh, you, what produces your billing hours, these should be investments that you're making money off of and not costing you money. Is, is that right? It was a long way to get yeah. to that example, but yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, when you think about like a paralegal, for example, you know, maybe I don't know, maybe even on the high side, 55 or 60 they're making, mm -hmm. you know, if you're paying 55 them, or 60 thousand dollars a year, yeah. So if you're paying them like 25 30 dollars an hour. But you're billing them out at $150 an hour, there's your five times. Right. You know, so you multiply that out by the year and you do, I mean, even if you give a bonus for, you know, exceeding the billable hours or whatever, you know, it's still 10% of whatever it is. You're still not. You know, you're not going into the hole. Right. So that's the whole idea is that the people that are working for you are making money for the firm. Right. So uh, how many people are you working with right now? I know you're kind of selective about who you'll take on, but if, if, if you're willing to talk about that, how many people do you? Right now, I've got five clients that I do 24-7, you know, business management, whatever. And then I have people that will say, hey, I need to hire somebody or I need to do, you know, I'm not I'm not real pushy. If people are like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not that worried about it. But here's something. Could you do this? I'll help them. Um, if other attorneys are like, hey, you know, I want you to take over and, you know, kind of be like a 24 seven. I'll do that as well. And two, things are cyclical. You know, you have people for a while and then they either move on, they get a bigger firm, they hire somebody, whatever. So, but right now I have five steady clients that I do work for and then a handful or so that I do other things for. And yes, I am very particular. Uh, you <laughs> you kind of let me into why that is and I won't I won't get into uh, secret stuff, but financially you're you're solvent. You're you're okay. You don't 
You're not doing this because you need the money. Is that a, is that a fair no, statement? That, that's a fair statement. I'm not doing this because I need the money. And, you know, the people that I work with, I want to be, ha you know, I'm, all right, so we figured out how old I am. What am I, like, pushing 60? You know, I'm not, I'm not in this for the grind. You You're know not what empire I mean? building. Yeah, You're more I'm, doing it because you enjoy it. Exactly. And the people that I work for, I'm happy. They're my friends. They, you know, I'll do anything for them. You know, that's just... And for my colleagues uh, out there, uh, I'm not going to name names, but I can tell you that the people that she's helped, you've heard of and are successful in, in, in the area. So these are not necessarily, not that she wouldn't help someone starting out, but people that you know and are doing well have uh, benefited from, from working with Liz. So um, anyway, uh, if someone is interested in, in speaking with you, are you still open to taking on new clients? Absolutely, okay. I still am. And do you have a website or how is it that people find you? I have a website, it's called um, From Lawyer to Law Firm, okay. same title as my book. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to mention, um, you know, we, we sell the book on our website uh -huh. for $49. Uh -huh. If you go to Amazon or eBay, the publisher sells it for $149. Uh -huh. And the reason I did that is because the law school is buying them for their students, so right. I wanted them to be affordable. Um, they can also call me at 813-340-9569, or they can email me at liz.managementconsultant at gmail.com. And, of course, I'm all over Facebook. And if, they, if you are reaching out to her because of this podcast, I'd appreciate it if you'd mentioned that you reached out yeah. to her because of this podcast. I might even buy the book for you if you, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you mention me. <sighs> anyway, so, well, I thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, we actually have to meet after this to talk about uh, what I'm doing wrong that we just, we <laughs> just discussed. But, uh, well, I wouldn't say what you're doing Not doing wrong, wrong, but what I could be doing better. Okay. I mean... Yeah, I mean, at 20 years, I've, I've, I've survived a recession and, you know, multiple uh, staff changes. So I'm resilient, if, if nothing else. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you so much, Liz, for coming in. It was a pleasure, as always, to talk with you. And uh, hopefully you'll come back as you have uh, new literature for, uh, for my colleagues to kind of get to know. And, and, and hopefully uh, you'll get some calls. Yeah, so, hopefully. But right. thank you for having me, Josh. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you.